is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I also thought I was going after Amy, so surprise. <laughs> Um, I am a librarian, and that's one of the reasons why it's uh, such an honor to be here. Librarian on the stage, yay. Um, <laughs> maybe some librarians out there, yay. Um, but I work for OCLC, which is a nonprofit, member based co cooperative that helps libraries share information and resources worldwide. And uh, some of my ideas about community, about libraries in the 21st century and the content that we typically are the purveyors of um, have come from my work but also from my life experience and so I'd like to start by talking a little bit about um, where I grew up essentially. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, a beautiful place, uh, water trees, mountains, all of that um, natural beauty. It was an incredible backdrop. Um, to uh, the way I grew up, because I didn't grow up in this lovely city. I actually grew up way, way, way back there, <laughs> about an hour and a half away um, in this tiny little town called Port Orchard. And uh, lots of people grew up in small towns, uh, so there's not um, anything particularly unique about that, I guess. Um, but my experience there was unique because I was also raised in a very small, very cloistered, um, information-controlled environment. Uh, my parents uh, were very religious, and uh, we were part of a very small religious community. Uh, and this included things like church four times a week, and um, homeschooling, and uh, lots and lots of rules. Um, and I don't want to disparage my parents at all. There was so much love in that community and so much love for me. Um, but there was a, a particular life that they saw for me, and it went along with their values and their ideas about the way things should be. And uh, it wasn't until I <laughs> visited the Port Orchard branch of the uh, Kitsap Regional Library System that I realized that there was going to be uh, so much more for me. Uh, this is their place on the web right now, um, but the building that you see there is exactly the same building that I remember entering as a child, um, browsing the books. My parents couldn't control every movement. I thought, oh my gosh, there's so much here for me to take in. It was a very powerful experience for me. And in fact, it's also the place where I discovered the very first book that was going to have an impact on me besides the Bible, of course. Um, Thoughts of Thoreau. I, don't know how I got this one past my parents. I think if they had known that it was going to change my life in the way that it did, they would have hid it um, behind the stack somewhere. But um, these words, like I went to the woods to live deliberately and suck out all the marrow of life, they just became my words. They became the words that I lived by. So I underlined and I highlighted. I wrote in the margins. I turned down the pages. I extended my borrowing privileges. And then... <laughs> <laughs> and then I stole it. <laughs> I just I couldn't bear to let this book go. I <laughs> needed for it to be mine. And so there you have it. Uh, the, <laughs> the librarian of the 21st century was born. I, <laughs> I uh, fast forward 15 or 20 years and I'm actually in library school in this very building um, in Seattle. And uh, <clears throat> I went to library school, I have to admit, because I thought of rooms like this. I thought of um, spaces like this. And I imagined, I couldn't imagine, actually, that <laughs> someone's going to pay me to sit in a room like this all day, surrounded by books. Um, so I thought, perfect career for me. But I was in for a surprise, because <laughs> this was 1999. And this was also the year that many library schools all over the country were rethinking their curriculum because of the massive change that had happened um, in regards to content, access, and delivery because of the technology that um, our culture has essentially experienced um, over the preceding decades. And so <laughs> they gave my cohort, I was the very last one, very last year of the century to choose between the old library school and the new library school. And, or information school, I should say. And I chose the new, and I had no idea what I was getting into. I was signing up for things like Unix-based scripting, and I had barely used an email, email account. And so um, it's, 
absolutely changed me. I remember the moment, um, in fact, when I realized what a website was, and I understood that anyone could publish content, and it could be globally distributed and accessed then by anyone who had access to the internet, and that changed me. I put that together with my ideas about information equality, and I knew that I was interested in finding the future of library service and being a part of that work. My first job at a library school, however, was <laughs> not all that I thought it was going to be. I will not name the system, but this is a picture of the unfortunate building <laughs> that I worked in. Very low ceilings, terrible lighting, um, services that could have been improved, from, at least from where I sat in my entry level position. Um, <laughs> having answered a reference question one day uh, with a Google search, and I was very excited about it. One of my colleagues said, every computer in the public library should be bludgeoned with a sledgehammer. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the library I signed up for, not the information industry that I signed up for. Around the same time, I came across this picture of a Library of Congress, I think it's 1906, and I recognized these faces as the faces of my colleagues. I recognized <laughs> <laughs> this building as the building that I was working in. I recognized this reference desk, this ominous, scary reference desk, as um, the barrier between me and the people that I wanted to serve and work with. And so th this experience really started to frame the central questions of my work so far in libraries. Um, I was wondering about the essential role of libraries, um, how that might relate to the communities that they work in. So I started thinking about community building. What was the library's role in community building? And if people were doing it, what was working and what was not working? So the first thing I did is go back to some of the reading that I had done in library school. I was reading things like Ray Oldham. I was reading things like John C. Lee Brown, The Social Life of Documents. Uh, reading uh, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, and I won't go into descriptions of all of these things, a huge impact on me, but the thread was that community building was happening, or caution, it's not. And it was happening uh, because of content, it was happening because of technology, and it was happening in the physical spaces that we uh, are in, in our daily lives. But I also was thinking about the conversations that I was having with uh, my colleagues when I was in library school, so it wasn't just the books. And that's where my friend Matt comes in. One day after a lecture about information needs, my friend Matt says to me, and we're talking about whether or not the public library is relevant in our daily lives, he says to me, the most important information need that I have is what are my friends doing? And this was long, long, long before things like Twitter and Flickr and Facebook and FriendFeed. It's crazy now, all the different ways you can find out what your friends are doing. We didn't have access to that at that time. Um, but it was really important to him. He wasn't talking about what are my friends doing tonight. He was talking about what are my friends reading, what are they watching, where are they going, where are they visiting, what do they care about? Because that was a source of learning and information for him that he really valued. So you put these two things together and I started to wonder, where is the library in all this? Are people thinking? about um, community building? Are they thinking about the social networks and the information that we glean from them? <laughs> the answer is not so much. <laughs> um, this is research actually published by OCLC in 2007 um, that looks at the behaviors of um, many folks online between 2005 and 2007. Um, people who are actually used to the internet have access to it. And the only activity that went down over this time frame were things like using email and online bookstores is visits to the library website. So we have definitely missed some kind of boat here. Um, one of the reasons why I think we have is because it's a little scary for librarians. It's certainly not organized. And librarians, they like organization. It's also not controlled. That's one of the classes they make you take in library school, controlled vocabulary. And so, <laughs> it's true. The, <laughs> the other thing that I think, and this, I don't want this to sound like an excuse, but we struggle with funding. Um, institutionally, our culture um, is one of uh, deprivation. We never have enough funding. And so, and I know this community understands 
that as much as any, but it's such a real threat all over the country, in, fla in fact, the world, um, this uh, lack of support for, um, for our libraries. Um, this library actually closed all 15 of their branches and couldn't get enough support from the community um, because of that disconnect, I think, between our daily lives and our daily information needs and the services that the library provided. And so something is wrong, terribly wrong with this, with this, uh, um, these circumstances. And I set out to try and figure out what we could, what we could do about it. Because still, so many of us, either when we think about libraries or we visit one, are seeing this when we enter those doors. One of the first things that I did to try to solve these problems is go back to the library literature. And of course, librarians have been talking about community building for a very long time. In many of those spaces, however, they're talking to each other. So we really need to get out um, beyond this world <laughs> of our libraries and, and into the discourse. Um, the other thing that I looked at is what our users were saying about libraries. Um, and not surprisingly, books. Books are our brand. Books, books, that's all I'll ever think. And <laughs> that's what I'll always think, books. Um, this is not a terrible thing for us as um, as librarians because people have this wonderful nostalgia and positivity that goes along with that um, idea of a library and it's taking care of the books. But it can be a bad thing for us when content is moving into new formats, new ways of exchanging and receiving information. They don't think of us when it's time to fill those information needs. If you look further into what some of our patrons or users are saying about libraries, um, you'll see that they're also giving us some advice. Look to places like Starbucks and Borders for that community interaction. Look at places like Google and uh, try to be more relevant in the digital age. So what does it mean to be relevant in the current age? Well, one of the things is the social networking and social media stuff. Um, this is, again, OCLC research from six countries that looked at public's use of social networking and social media sites. 28% of their respondents had said that they had tried this. This is in 2007. You ask college kids the same question, and those figures go up to 56%. Now, I am sure that by far, probably everyone in this room has had um, experience um, with these sites. So it's just really a... Um, incredibly powerful phenomenon that's affecting every way that we engage with information. Now, if you ask these people why they're visiting these sites, every single one of them will tell you, regardless of their age, it's because my friends are there. So back to that question that my friend Matt posed to me way back when we were in information in library school, what are my friends doing? That has become such a powerful, powerful um, force in our culture. And so I've spent the last three years talking with library staff who are thinking about their practice through a community building lens. And uh, I just published a book and I'm very, I'm so mad I didn't bring my copy so I could show it to you. They didn't tell me I could do that. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I, it's been such a wonderful project because I've had a chance to talk with all these librarians librarians who are doing community building work. Um, one of the very first things they said, and this is across the board, is that um, libraries should be about the people, not about the books, not about the services that we think they need. The other thing they told me was that when you pay attention to the people, you're really in tune with what their needs are. One of my favorite examples is uh, Rachel McNeely who's at the uh, mission branch of the San Francisco Public Library. And uh, she managed to turn a once a week, 40 person lap sit program for kids in her neighborhood to five times a week, 120 in attendance at every session. She did that over a period of nine months. She did that because she paid attention to what her community, not just the users inside the library, but those out in her neighborhood, she said, I live in this neighborhood. This kid's can't stay away from my programs for long. So she's really out there listening. Ultimately, find the needs, build a library. The other thing that I heard from the library um, staff that I talked to, and maybe this is a reflection of the things that we're hearing from our patrons, it's not about the books. It's about that human interaction 
that connection that we make for people when we connect them with information. And the other thing I heard is that <sighs> these librarians are willing to get out from behind the reference desk, get out into the world that um, so many of our community members are also experiencing. This is a librarian, his name is Michael, and from Michael I learned about things like Twitter and Flickr and <laughs> Facebook and FriendFeed. He was one of the very first librarians, I think, in these spaces, and this was, again, so many years ago before it was mainstream. And I think from his experiences there, and now so many of us, we've learned that there's so many connections that we make through these online spaces to really blend every aspect of our lives and um, ultimately um, provide some, I guess, mingling of our professional and our personal lives and uh, really, um, I guess, bring home that uh, these tools that we use, the books that we read, the information that we gather for whatever reason is ultimately about the desire to make a connection with another person. And so for my last example here, I want to return to my other hometown library. I'm a city girl now. Um, <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about not just a, a fabulous librarian who's doing amazing community building things, but a whole system. Um, that's a Seattle Public Library system. They've just renovated all of their branches. So I'm going to start with what they've done with their library spaces inside the library. Most famously, um, they opened a few years ago a new central branch that was designed um, by Rem Coolhouse of um, OMA. And uh, it's really an amazing building because it literally reflects the values and the practices of the residents in the city of Seattle. Um, one of the things it does, for example, is catches the rain and heats and cools the building. Many Seattle residents do this, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but it also has things like you can actually lift up the flooring so that as technology, hardware um, needs change and networking changes, they can actually, the building can shift with it. Um, you walk into the building on the main floor and it's called the living room. There's no books, no materials, no computers. None of the things that we now think of as uh, traditional library services, um, but instead places to gather, to sit down on a couch or across the table from someone, even order a cup of coffee. Their branches are much the same, this mixing of uh, technology along with traditional library services and again, spaces to just sit and talk with other people. Their programs are amazing as well. Uh, one of their most well-attended programs is the summer reading program. But a few years ago, they realized that only kids that were speaking English at home were attending their summer reading programs. So they expanded their program to include Chinese first, then Spanish and Vietnamese in order to better reach out to the community that they aim to serve. Now there's 22 languages spoken in just one neighborhood, um, just a couple of blocks away from the building that I just showed you. So there's still so much work to be done there. And then finally, they're doing this stuff online as well. Um, this is a picture of their teen page, but they don't just focus on their website. They're using things like blogs, Flickr, MySpace, and all of these social tools to really engage um, with the teens that they serve. And in fact, they have um, some teen-created content that an advisory board that is uh, volunteers from the community works on together. So the library is actually giving over to their patrons the ability to um, develop content and present it as part of the library. Um, one of the, the librarians that I talked with about this project said to me, we are building community in a way now that we couldn't have even imagined a year ago. And most of them are boys, she said to me. So really, really amazing stuff happening here. And then finally, this is just my one last point. Um, the librarians that I spoke with talked about the future, all of them very sustainability oriented, thinking about um, how to make sure that their services are available for years to come. Um, one of the things that they said was that we need to make sure that our community knows that we're here from them, what services we provide. Really, the onus is on us to make sure that we're out there and engaged. But what I would ask you before I close here is to engage with us in that process. If you think, as I do, that we have an incredible 
opportunity as institutions that are highly valued and that provide a just incredible um, service, um, it, the keepers of human knowledge, essentially, um, and such a, a glorious history around that. If you think that we can build on that and maybe broaden our focus so that it's not just about the um, authoritated content that we're providing access to and distributing, but instead focusing on the reason why we distribute that content so that people can make that human connection, whether it's a reader to a book or a peer-to-peer, -peer, um, whatever it may be. The reason why we do that is so that everyone has equal opportunity to learn and ultimately enrich their lives, and that's so important. So what I would ask you is to tell us, what can your library do to be a partner with the community um, to uh, participate in its growth and development. And then please, please, just tell us. Thank you.